Hello and welcome to Bring the World Home. This is a production of the Return Peace Corps Volunteers of Hawaii. My name is Linda Chalk and I will be your host for today's program. I was a Return Peace Corps volunteer from 1966 to 1968 in the Northern Mariana Islands of Micronesia. With us today, we have Jane and Paul Heimerdinger. Welcome. Thank you, Linda. Jane Thank you. And Our Paul. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having and us. And they went into the Peace Corps as a couple yes. and served also in the Federated States of Micronesia Correct. in the Yap Islands. On, right. on Yap Island. Right. right. On Yap Island. Right. And we're going to show you um, this is Hawaii in the middle of the Pacific. And the Federated States of Micronesia are just east of the Philippines in this area right here. And Yap is closest, I guess, of the uh, five island groups closest to the Philippines. Yes, That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about Yap, what it was like, what, what the environment is like? Yap what? probably is what... Um, you might think old traditional Hawaii was like before the missionaries came. Oh. With uh, um, the men wear malos and the women wear grass skirts and uh, they live off of taro and fish from the sea. Mm -hmm. And life is very slow and easy and most days are beautiful and sunny and nice. They live in, in huts, uh, little small little houses, usually raised up off the ground a little bit with a platform. Mm -hmm. They're really mostly just for sleeping because the rest of the time you're just outdoors. Uh, you don't really stay in your house for anything except in the evening. So they get poles from the forest and they build a frame of a house and then they cover it with thatch on the, on the roof and then they weave some sort of pandanus or something walls for the sides oh. and just kind of strap that up and, and that's their little shelter. What inspired you to join the Peace Corps? I understand that you were married for about 10 years, ten years prior mm -hmm. to considering the Peace Corps and, and ap applying. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So what inspired you to... Well, uh, I think that um, we were certainly motivated by uh, the Kennedy era and mm -hmm. his plea to young people of, uh, you know, all ages really, people mm -hmm. of all ages, to rise up and serve the nation. And of course he had a wonderful global perspective on the world and he knew that we had um, talents that we could possibly share with people in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So we were very motivated by um, the Peace Corps, which he started, of course. Um, and also we, you know, were raised in um, obviously separate families, but both families were um, service oriented. So oh. in, in Paul's household and my household, we were always encouraged to give back and help the communities. I see. So you did a lot of volunteer work even before the Peace Corps. We, we did, did, yes. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. yeah, it's part we of our life. <laughs> <laughs> worked with handicapped children on, mm -hmm. on a volunteer basis, mm -hmm. and we worked for Special Olympics mm -hmm. um, and other things like that. I see. Mm -hmm. Was it a fairly long process when you were applying and then going through the different types of uh, reviews, the yes, medical Yes, actually it was choices. kind of long. Um, we uh, were given three choices. Our first choice was to go to Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, we had been there uh, on a vacation actually to visit some relatives. Uh, oh, Jane's cool. sister was in Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, and then we decided on South America as our second choice and then we the, the Pacific looked wonderful so we put that down as our third choice. I see. Mm -hmm. But they had a difficult time placing two teachers in the same community. Uh -huh. um, so that, that kind of made the process kind of long. Um, and we had an offer to go to Jamaica, um, but we decided it wasn't very safe there at that time. At that time yeah. And so we declined that offer, and then we got the offer from Micronesia, and we said, well, that's a couple of years <laughs> in the Pacific sounds wonderful, <laughs> let's try it. And we haven't regretted it for a second ever right. since. We knew very little about it. Hadn't oh. even heard of it, of course. It's just a little dot in the ocean. That's right. Uh, so we had to look it up in National <laughs> Geographic and those sorts of things to, to find out something about it before we decided mm -hmm. to say yes. So what kind of training did the Peace Corps offer you? Um, were you trained back in the United States or 
um, in the house country? Sure. Well, well, training actually started in California. We came together with a group of about 130 uh, people who were heading into all parts of Asia, oh. basically, the uh -huh. Philippines and oh. um, so on. And um, so there was about a week of training there, and I must say that there was a fair amount of dropout at that point. I think as people began to realize that these were um, somewhat rugged areas that we were being yes. sent into, mm -hmm. that they preferred uh, to stay back in the United States, and they, mm -hmm. they could do other things, you know, in their home. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, we flew then to Guam, where training continued. There were several days in Guam. And again, at that point, more people began to drop out. Mm -hmm. So, but Paul and I, we were in it for the long haul. We knew okay. we wanted to do this. And um, so we, at one point, boarded a plane with about six other volunteers and headed down into the Micronesian Islands. At that time, they called it the Island Jumper Plane because it stopped at all the different islands mm -hmm. down the way. Very small plane. Mm -hmm. wow. And I remember the day that we um, finally got to Yap and that we were circling over this island and the pilot kept saying, now if you look out your left-hand window, you'll see the island of Yap. And the more we looked out, the more we said, well, it's awfully <laughs> tiny <laughs> down there. <laughs> And indeed, <laughs> it, it was 10 miles long and one mile wide. Oh, wow. Yeah. So. Very small. So a coral atoll. Atoll, coral, yes. yes. Atoll. Yeah. Sure, sure. Had a, pr a reef, protective reef all the way around, which mm -hmm. was wonderful for fishing mm -hmm. and very important to their survival, of course. Mm -hmm. They ate fish mm -hmm. uh, every day. Almost, except wow. the only yes. times when they didn't have fresh fish would be during the rainy season mm -hmm. when the streams would uh, take muddy water out into the ocean. They'd be cloudy and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So fishing was not good, but the rest of the time, the fresh could, fish. Could you speak English to the natives or did you have to learn their language? Well, limited we certainly had to. English, e yeah, very, very limited. limited. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, but our, our training continued then on YAP. We were about. No, six, six weeks. weeks in training mm -hmm. on on the island of Yap itself, which included um, intensive language training and mm -hmm. cross cultural training, training, of course, which was a very important part of the training. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. were living with the host family or on your own in Yap? The, we were living um, at, at actually we were staying at the local high school oh. um, in okay. a classroom is where we we would sleep at, mm -hmm. at night and then. In another other classrooms during the day, we would have our, our language lessons and our cultural lessons. And we ate meals in the cafeteria at that point. So I think the Peace Corps had arranged uh, to hire some cooks and to cook our meals. And I must say that was our first real introduction to rice and spam. Oh. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> plenty of <laughs> really? rice and plenty of spam in training. <laughs> and fish. And fish, oh, yes. yes. Fish too. Almost nearly yeah. every day, sometimes yeah. chicken, and for a celebration, some pork. But oh. it's really mostly just fat I with see. a very little bit of meat. What sort of projects or assignments did the Peace Corps have um, uh, assigned to you? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, well, I was sent as a teacher trainer. Okay. And um, that actually was a very difficult role for me because it, the society is dominated by the male population, oh, and the I female see. population are. Um, considered less capable mm -hmm. in, in many ways. I see. And so for a woman to come in and take on a leadership role with men was um, not the best assignment. Oh, I see. And it made things difficult. Made things very difficult. Because of their cultural values. That's correct. That's correct. Oh. Um, but I gave it a try. Uh -huh. And um, the, um, you know, it was evident that it really wasn't going to work after uh, about eight months. Uh -huh. I shifted my assignment and, I and took on other responsibilities mm -hmm. where I had less interaction for, with the men. I yeah. see. Ooh, and so. more with women then? And more with women. I worked with the women um, in gardening. I uh, worked a lot with the children mm -hmm. in um, library. We set up a library oh. in our village. Yeah. And um, you did curriculum work? And I did curriculum work. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. more behind the scenes. And yes. then there, were, you know, there was just less friction. Mm -hmm. and, um, and actually building from, from beneath was the best way for me to use my services. I see. Yeah. Yes. And I also wrote a... Um, 
series of books mm -hmm. for the young children to use in the early years, uh, mm -hmm. and I wrote it in Yapese, their native oh, language. Really? Right. Yeah. Wow. So that was that was very exciting. That was a very fun project. Mm -hmm. Did you did you find a sample? Um, we didn't. We're still looking. Okay. <laughs> But it was, uh, it was quite successful, and um, they were a series of small books called uh, Bochayat Kobatir, which uh -huh. means some stories for children. Uh -huh. So very, you know, obvious and simple title because it was the first time that they had actually seen things written in their native tongue at the elementary level. I see. So but these were stories that they've heard from their parents and grandparents? Well, yes. Um, mm -hmm. More, I wrote stories about just the everyday life, you know. Oh, I see. Yeah, the women working in the garden, preparing baskets of food to take to market, uh -huh. um, slaughtering pigs um, mm -hmm. at special times of the year. I wrote a story about um, funerals, ones about weddings. Mm -hmm. so Documenting their lifestyle. Their lifestyle, right. Oh, yeah. Very simple vocabulary and mm -hmm. illustrated. And these are for the elementary school That's students? correct, oh. for the elementary school. How wonderful. Yeah. Really. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my role was to replace a teacher who was uh, took time off to do some advanced studying mm -hmm. uh, to, and then would come back and take over the class again. So actually I, I did see. that for two years. Uh -huh. um, and they went off island. And, and They had a general curriculum like we do here in the United States? Or did they you tailor it a little? They maybe had it down on paper, but in what actually happened in the schools was a, a different thing. These were very remote, small schools. I probably had 12 students or something oh, like that in yes. maybe in those two grade levels, and mm -hmm. the materials and supplies were very limited, oh. uh, and the equipment in the classrooms were, was in very poor shape. Mm -hmm. So we had a light or two in the ceiling, but sometimes there was no power, and um, My goodness. And uh, the textbooks were eaten by termites and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, just paper and pencil was kind of a major task to have on hand often. That's quite a challenge. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, their whole attitude toward education really wasn't very strong because in order to live off the land, to, to garden and to fish, uh, you don't really need to have that type of an education mm -hmm. in English and history and math mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So. It wasn't really recognized by a lot of the people as as being important way to advance your lifestyle or your career because it, their lifestyle <coughs> wasn't going to change very much. Was there much communication with the outer world besides you know just the yap and truck? So you know they could really see what else was happening in the world and how an education might benefit them. Yeah. No, uh, it really was very limited. Um, they sort of had an idea that uh, all the world is just islands with a lot of ocean really? around yeah. it. And they even had a hard time conceiving uh, large pieces of land like the United States. Mm -hmm. um, th they thought that the water would just be a short distance away, always. Oh. Um, yeah. So, and, and we had no radio. Uh, no, sometimes we would listen to Voice of America. Mm -hmm. We could get that, but mm -hmm. that was even difficult for us to pick up on I a radio. See. So, um, and on the island, there there wasn't any television, and and mm -hmm. there wasn't uh, uh, weren't any VCRs and that sort of thing. So, it was kind of remote. Um, I don't mm -hmm. even remember if we had a newspaper. No, not, not unless, get. you know, it would come in on one of the <coughs> cargo ships, which came in occasionally. How often did the ships visit? It was maybe twice a year. Twice a ship a year. would come wow. in, and that's how the cans of Spam would get in. I <laughs> see, my goodness. And everybody would go down to the dock to meet the ship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we would um, participate and yet, in a way, stand back, too, and just watch the the kind of cargo that came off the ship was mm -hmm. not really the cargo that they needed. But I see. That's another story. <laughs> mm. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, um, so besides canned foods and maybe some material, or mm -hmm. it was maybe some building materials, building. that sort of thing, <coughs> uh, petrol, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. crackers, cookies. Mm -hmm. Things like Just that. So they ate a lot of non shit biscuits non there. Non-perishable. Right. 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 Yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember we had a, a terrible 
a hurricane while we were there that just oh, went on yes. for days. And we all went into the mountains, into the caves from the old um, war uh, to seek protection because the uh, our particular village, which was right on the shoreline, mm -hmm. was pretty much wiped out. And so the pigs okay. were washed out the sea, <coughs> chickens, the dogs were washed out. Um, and at any rate, soon after that, the United Nations mm -hmm. sent corrugated tin. And I remember when that came in on the ship mm -hmm. and um, brought out, uh, you know, f I don't know, 50 sheets were brought out to our village. Mm -hmm. And that was a little disheartening because we knew they didn't need corrugated tin. It's, it's very dangerous. It mm -hmm. rusts mm -hmm. and it's very hot to use as a roof for those uh, thatched huts. Um, so we were, you know, those kinds of things were disappointing to us, but we... Um, Westernization mm -hmm. was happening. Right. Yeah. Mm. So they used the corrugated tin to set up temporary housing, or... Mm -hmm. Probably used it for the permanent. roof of their, their houses. Oh, I see. They yeah. also were giving them uh, cement and cinder blocks to start to build oh. cinder block homes that would resist the hurricane, mm -hmm. uh, when in fact the... the Houses that they built uh, out of thatch and, and with uh, poles from the forest could easily be rebuilt. Yes. And they were much cooler right. in the mm -hmm. evening and they were very satisfactory mm -hmm. for their lifestyle rather than having a cement floor and cinder block walls, which mm -hmm. would make a very hot uh, environment. Or, right, or especially the corrugated tin. I know that um, in the Marianas, when we had a severe hurricane, mm -hmm. you could see some of the corrugated roofing wrapped around the Trees, trees, you know, that's right. just yes, from right. the yeah, because it rips and flies in right. the wind. Yeah, it's very yeah. dangerous. It's very, flying. very dangerous. Yeah. And and I must say too that after strong rainstorms and hurricanes, mm -hmm. part of rebuilding the village is part of the important piece of the culture. You know, oh. because that's how children learn to, um, you know, Build to weave the, the palms, yeah. mm -hmm. weave, weave the houses. things together, uh -huh. lash the poles together to uh -huh. make the coconut rope. Mm -hmm. Uh, for all of that. So it's it's just a part of living mm -hmm. right. there and, and their lifestyle. And they have the time to do all of that. Mm -hmm. right. Most people aren't employed. Mm -hmm. Most people just live in the village and they have their gardens where they raise their taro uh -huh. and some other uh, vegetables. Not mm -hmm. very many vegetables mm -hmm. there. I see. Um, and they have chickens and maybe a pig mm -hmm. uh, and they have fish. So all the families, the, the family owns land and, and it's much like Hawaii is where it's a pie slice from the high mountain down to the ocean oh, shore. So you yes. get a variety of land uh, styles mm -hmm. where you can have gardens and others with low land where you uh, can grow your taro, that sort of thing. I and then see. you have some uh, ocean uh, coral reef uh -huh. that belongs to your, your I extended family, not mm -hmm. just your immediate family. So they tend to live in family compounds uh, on their area. And you fish your own area. You don't fish somebody else's area, of course, yes. without permission and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And when you fish, you, you bring it back to the village and you share it with your mm -hmm. family. Quite an egalitarian and society. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Paul actually did a lot of night fishing oh, with the gentlemen yes. from the village, and uh -huh. they would um, fish by torches. So during the day, they would prepare their torches, mm -hmm. and then made out of uh, made out of um, dried palm from. Mm -hmm. They would okay. wrap it around the end of mm -hmm. bamboo uh -huh. and um, soak it in kerosene. I mm -hmm. see. And um, head out, you know, after dark, and you. It was really a lovely sight. The women would stand on the shoreline because the women are really not allowed to go into the ocean. So we would stand oh. on the shoreline and mm -hmm. watch the men, you know, in single file mm -hmm. going off into what appeared to be the, the vast dark ocean. It's very dark out there. Very at night dark. Without I see. the moon. Real. But they would yeah. have these torches, and so uh -huh. you knew that your husband or your son or your brother was the third torch or the fifth torch going out, so you would identify your family member by the placement in that line. I see. And they would walk out to the reef, which mm -hmm. was, you know, quite a ways out in mm -hmm. Yap. And then we would sit on the shoreline, batting the mosquitoes and um, watching for those torches to keep, you know, moving along the reef line mm -hmm. late at night. 
and by two or three in the morning then you'd see the torches beginning to come in and you knew the, the men were coming back wow. and so we would wait quietly again on the shoreline and they would lay all the fish out on the beach and then it was the women's responsibility that night to clean the fish so then oh. we would stay up the rest of the night cleaning the fish and they would so the chief or the the, the person whose whose area you were fishing in mm -hmm. usually would distribute amongst mm -hmm. the fishing mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. the fish that they had caught and then when you bring it home then the, the wife is expected to clean to prepare the fish it. Right. prepare <laughs> it and by breakfast you would be having of course fish. fresh fish, fresh fish and yeah. taro yeah. Uh -huh. And they probably would have to grate the coconut and make mm -hmm. the coconut milk and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Or mm -hmm. maybe breadfruit you might mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And that sort of thing. Tapioca root. Mm -hmm. Tapioca, yeah. yeah. So those are great memories. How, oh, how did they catch the fish? Were they using nets or lines? Sometimes or it was a net. Sometimes it was a throw net. Uh -huh. I learned to, th to throw a net. Uh, sometimes it was a gill net where they would stretch a long net out and the mm -hmm. fish swim in and get caught by their gills. But most of the time it was spear fishing. I see. And they had, um, actually we would get spear guns. We would go to the local um, police station, which was about three rooms big. Um, and actually the door was open. You could see the prisoners standing at the front door because there was nowhere to run. When you're only 10 <laughs> miles long and one mile wide, they'll catch you anyway. Okay. Um, but anyway, I, I, they, the prisoners, to earn extra money would make these little spear guns and they would carve them out of wood uh -huh. and then they would bend a fork and, and they would put some surgical tubing on it and that was the, the power or the force for the, the spear elastic. that you would buy right. mm -hmm. and notch it and then a clothespin I think was oh, even involved in <laughs> yeah. it. Uh -huh. And uh, so we would use those spear guns or, the, or they would use the Hawaiian sling occasionally but most of them had these little so they guns. just fished off of the boats that they were on rather than diving well rarely or? did we go on a boat most of it was done on bamboo raft long bamboos uh -huh. that were latched together and I you see. pole your way uh -huh. out into the reef and then you anchor it and then you just dive off of that uh, raft the water is not very deep in most areas mm -hmm. it might not be much more than I don't know 10 12 feet deep mm -hmm. and a lot of times you can stand on on the coral heads um, but they're very good at diving down and holding their breath and staying for a long time. Mm -hmm. And in the salt water, for me, I, I didn't <coughs> weigh very much, but it was very hard to get off the surface of the water <laughs> and even get down very close. Right, and um, also at night it was Well, hard at, to do. that was yeah. at daytime, but at nighttime was even harder, yeah. yeah. And uh, so it was very interesting, fun. Mm -hmm. I loved the fishing. We just have a few minutes. It's gone by so quickly, oh, gosh, but yes. I, I noticed that you brought some of the artifacts from Yap and Micronesia. Can right. you tell us a little bit about it? Probably the most significant maybe is the uh -huh. shell money uh, over there. Okay. This is uh, money that's uh -huh. used in sort of traditional, perhaps, uh, exchanges. You wouldn't go to the store and, and buy some spam or corned beef or anything like that <laughs> using shell money. <coughs> but you might uh, exchange it in a, in a wedding ceremony or something uh, of that sort. Oh, or uh, exchange it perhaps in, in helping for a canoe uh, and that, that sort of thing. Yep, is um, also very well known for this the large stone money. Stone right. money. Yes, money. And, yes, and you probably think that the value is determined by the size of the stone, and that's not correct. Oh. It's determined by the adventure that was, uh, or the dangers involved in retrieving that stone. The story behind They had to the sa story. sail many miles to a, mm -hmm. a place, I don't know if it was down by, by New Palau, I think. Uh, Palau yeah. or somewhere, mm -hmm. um, and, and bring it back on, on these bamboo rafts or these catamarans oh that we yeah. see like Hawaiian canoes. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes they encountered storms and lost lives and those sorts of things. So that's the story is determines the value. I see. Mm -hmm. And you again would exchange that perhaps for a canoe or, or something like mm -hmm. that, major cultural mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of an axe uh, for helping to carve a, a canoe. They start of course out of a, with a big log mm -hmm. and they start chipping away the inside uh, and building oh. uh, their canoes. So they do um, have dugout canoes. They have canoes. Dug some dugout yes. canoes, mm -hmm. but they're not used very often. Mm -hmm. uh, they're much harder to get in and out of the water mm -hmm. and the rafts, two people can easily carry them and put them in and out of the water. Mm -hmm. 
and they keep them close to the shore, but the canoes, they need a canoe house with a thatched uh -huh. roof to protect it yes. from the sun and right. keep it dry. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have the chart over there. Oh, and we have an ocean chart here. Actually, goes this way. Mm -hmm. And this is made out of um, bamboo and little uh, cowrie shells. And the mm -hmm. shells re represent uh, atolls or islands, and the different uh, bamboo strips represent different currents oh. and things. And the um, navigators used to navigate by the stars, and, yes. and they would put a coconut shell with water in the canoe so they didn't have to look up all the time, and they Clever. could see the reflection yes. mm -hmm. of the stars in, in the coconut shell. Mm -hmm. And they were quite good uh, at navigating the, the ocean um, in their sailboats. And this is a, a hair uh, decorative piece for mm -hmm. the hair that the uh, men and women would wear, especially in celebrations and dances. I see. Yeah. And this is a little holder for um, gabui. It's the leaf that you wrap the betel nut in. Oh, yes. And so you mm -hmm. would keep your green ivy leaves in, in here. And I had a little container, I don't know where it's gone, that, uh, that had the lime in it. Mm -hmm. And we chewed Chew betel nut for you did, a couple yes. of years. <laughs> okay. and, and actually chewing tobacco with it. Yeah. Actually, we had <laughs> red, red teeth. teeth we did. Red did. <laughs> Our dentist had a fit <laughs> when we got back. <laughs> well, this has teeth. been very interesting, oh, and gosh. I want to thank you both very oh, much. You're very Jane. welcome. Yeah, thank you and for the opportunity. You thank you so good much. Memories. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. Yeah, good, good, good. And yeah. we want to thank you so much for joining us on Bring the World Home and to our audience. I hope that this sharing of an experience of both returned Peace Corps volunteers here has given you some inspiration for possibly joining the Peace Corps. Absolutely. Right. Check yeah. out our website and we'll see you again next week. Thank you very much.